Good evening, I'm Stephen Chair. Singapore's Budget 2024 was unveiled last Friday with a slew of initiatives for businesses, workers, households and Singaporeans of all ages. Tonight, I'm here with Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Lawrence Wong for a conversation about these measures. Good evening, Minister. Would Good you like evening. to kick things off with a few words? Sure. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. Well, this year's budget is about shaping and building our shared future together. Yep. Uh, we are taking proactive steps to help Singaporeans cope with higher prices. We are doing this for households yep. through the Enhanced Assurance Package. You've got more CDC vouchers, <laughs> which are welcomed, I'm sure, by everyone cash payouts for the lower and middle income groups, as well as rebates for utilities and so on. That's for households. We're also helping businesses cope with higher costs through a corporate income tax rebate, as well as cash payouts for companies that do not pay income tax. But beyond the immediate, we are also making significant policy shifts to better position Singapore for the future. So we are pursuing better growth and jobs and equipping workers for life through a very significant enhancement of skills future. We are strengthening our safety nets and giving assurances to families and seniors in areas like housing, retirement, mm -hmm. healthcare. And we are strengthening our resilience and security, especially in new challenges like the transition to cleaner energy and cybersecurity. Many of these ideas for this year's budget came from the Forward Singapore engagements we did last year. So in many ways, this year's budget is the first instalment of our Forward Singapore agenda. There will be more to come because you can't do everything in yeah. one budget, but uh, we will continue to fine tune and review and update our plans. And that's why we look forward to hearing from all of you and getting your inputs and feedback too. So let me introduce our panelists for today. May Lina Krishnan and Jeevan Ananthan, both entrepreneurs. And also with us are Pauline Tay Strawn, Professor of Sociology at the Singapore Management University, and Abdul Samad Abdul Wahab, Vice President of NTUC. So, welcome everyone. Uh, May and Jeevan, you know, you guys are a young family. I met your, your two year old daughter. Uh, what have you found helpful from this year's budget? You were concerned about preschool costs, especially, right? Yeah, so I think in your budget, you mentioned yeah. that uh, you'll be reducing preschool fees mm -hmm. to make it more affordable to be comparable with uh, primary school. That's right. Yeah, but um, so for uh, anchor, anchor partners, anchor operators, it's 640 yeah. and partner operators is 690. That's right. But if I'm looking correctly, for yeah. primary school fees per term yes. is $13. Yes, <laughs> understand. So before subsidies, so yeah. what is... How do, you, yeah. how do you square the... How do you reconcile yeah. the different figures? We said it would be comparable to primary school and after school care. So together. Together. Okay. So that comes up to about 300 plus dollars. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the anchor operator or partner operator fees, after subsidies, that's, that's where we are going, uh, we, we are aiming to get to that kind of a benchmark. Okay. Uh, and we are doing it in two steps. So this year we do one move, and then following year we will do another move. Okay. Yeah. What about the there's a lot. The challenge we faced was uh, vacancies. Yes. So not we are enough in, places. Not right? enough places. Yeah. And we got to apply like a year or two years I in know. advance. Yeah. Mm. We applied ten months in advance, and there was no vacancy. So yeah. They told us to send a kid to somewhere what eight kilometers away. Oh dear. Yeah, which is not yeah. feasible for for a baby. Yeah. So that's one of those things that for infant care is that right? Uh, yes. Mm. It was infant care. Infant care, preschool, preschool, childcare, childcare. Right. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. It it is. Um, there are tightness in some estates, particularly young estates with many young parents. Mm -hmm. and, and so we have to, you know, have more centres. We are doing so, we are, but it takes time. Surely. Uh, so we are really ramping up the supply. One of the constraints is getting enough teachers, yes. preschool teachers or even carers for infant mm -hmm. care. Uh, but we are training, we are ramping up the training as well. And hopefully over time, we will be able to fill the gaps. But it's something that we are aware of and we are doing our best to catch up with the demand. Would there perhaps be any plan to have a bigger space for mm. preschools? Yes. Like how primary schools are allocated yeah. land and buildings. Yeah. Would, would, there be, would this be in the pipeline for yes, preschools? Yes, we do that. We do already have some of these large scale uh, centres. Large centres. So it's not just at the void deck where then you're constrained by how many students you can take. But we do have bigger ones in Pongol, in uh, Woodlands. We do have some of these large-scale centres and we are going to build more of them. Okay, okay. good to so, hear. 
So it really is a, just a transitional phase that we're sort of going through. And, and it's great you're asking those questions it's because it means she's probably thinking of another kid, right? Yeah, so that's... Uh, <laughs> you don't know about, about it yet, yeah. It's very good. It's also tends to be um, location-specific. Yep. I mean, you don't have this issue in some estates. And then on the other hand, in other estates, you have uh, many of these uh, demand and shortage issues. So we have to find better ways to uh, ma match mm -hmm. the demand and supply. Okay. Well, I want to move on and talk about uh, lower income households. Uh, and Pauline and Samak, perhaps you can weigh in on this. You know, because it really isn't just a matter of giving out handouts or vouchers, you know, but we're trying to uplift and raise wages overall, right? So how do you think Budget 2024 has been able to help in this respect, Samak? So if you look at the first step, the increase in the workfare income supplement, right? Raising from 2005 to 3000 I think this is quite welcoming for all the lower income. The only thing that is keep bugging the uh, union leaders mm. is why should it be tagged to all the overtimes? Because to them, is I need to work extra hours to right. earn the extra income. So they hope that the uh, government can review this part in terms of the details of it. Uh, this is quite... Hopefully, then they will... They could actually qualify for the income, income, work for income supplement. Because these are usually what the challenges comes back to us. Uh, I don't qualify. My salary is below, but I need to earn the extra hours to be mm. away from family just to earn the extra income to meet my daily needs. So they hope that the uh, government can review this. And when we go into the details, where you go up, that is really very welcoming. Mm. But maybe we can tweak in the details, review edit. Uh, this is where the, the workers are hoping for. Mm -hmm. And other than that, I think the uh, support of uh, CDC vouchers. Uh, uh, at the NTC, we are very pleased. Uh, if you can recall, we had one session where we asked uh, the audience to uh, clap louder so that you can get CDC <laughs> grants higher. And I think you have proved it by giving more. Uh, we didn't expect to be well, more pleasing was we are giving it this year. So it's okay. very welcoming okay. for us. So these are all the support schemes. But end of the day, to me, it's the individual worker. The right. kind of jobs that you need to strive to earn a better income. To, because the opportunities are out there. Okay. And that can be a challenge for them. Pauline, what do you think? Well, I, you know, TPM, I think all Singaporeans appreciate the gifts that we got in the 2024 uh, budget. And financial assistance is always much welcome. But I guess thinking, you know, looking forward, uh, one has to wonder whether it's sustainable over time, mm -hmm. right? Um, in terms of inequalities, while well, income inequality is that big elephant in the room, there are mm -hmm. other aspects of inequality which I think we don't necessarily have to always turn to government to yeah. plug the gap. Mm -hmm. We should be empowered to unlock community assets mm -hmm. so that communities can help themselves. Yeah. So I think if we learn how to crystallise where the gaps are and to identify other players, philanthropies mm -hmm, yeah. included, mm -hmm, right, yeah. who can come in and help us build community. Very much so. And, you know, just to uplift yeah. the social capital yeah. where you live. Right? I don't have to be rich, but if I live in a neighbourhood where there is high social capital, my neighbours care about me, my children are always welcome into my neighbour's right. home. You know, and, and this, I think, will go a long way to uplift lower income. It's a community. Families. Mm. Definitely, yes. definitely. Well, I, I agree with uh, both points that were mentioned. Number one, we do want to make sure that whatever support we provide is fiscally sustainable. And the best definitely. way to ensure that is to maintain our current system of fiscal discipline and responsibility, maintain a balanced budget, which is what we are continually striving to do. Second is to make sure the way we design our schemes uh, does not lead to inadvertent consequences because we can see that happening in so many other places. We don't want to diminish the ethos of self-reliance yes. and individual effort. There's a lot to be cherished in that kind of an ethos of responsibility, right. both at the individual level and at the family level. And we will continue to design our schemes to encourage that. But thirdly, others <laughs> indeed can play a role. Others yeah. outside of the family, community, philanthropists, people who have done well. And that's what we are also trying to do in this budget by uh, doing more to encourage a culture of giving. So we are trying to pair up uh, high net worth individuals, philanthropists, people right. who have done well, yeah. to where the needs are in the community. They might be able to adopt a rental block, adopt families, and they can do their part too uh, not so much in uh, maybe in the f financial aspect, but really mm -hmm. the needs are more than just mm -hmm. financial, as Pauline you said. It could be in befriending, it could be mentoring, it could be providing the children of these families with new opportunities that they have never right. been able to access before. So these are ways in which we can continue to uplift our families in Singapore. 
Because at the end of the day, it really is, you know, if each of us are looking out for each of us, mm -hmm. then yeah. we have that community. Uh, but when it comes to families, there are often uh, challenges. You guys, you know, raising a young family, there, there are challenges too. How, how do you guys think this year's budget has also been uh, the measures, you know, in terms of for families out there, how do you think this will affect them and what's good for them? Okay, so for family side, I think the CDC voucher is uh, at least mitigate my income, my okay. expenses for the family because my children are benefiting from other support from the budget side, right? So it's what kind of, to me, it's about lifestyle. Right. Even if you give 6000 what kind of lifestyle do you want to eat? You may want, uh, if I can go to Luna Fish Balls, a uh, price more affordable as compared to... It's the kind of lifestyle that you need to go to. Uh, all others use safe rebates, uh, other kind of SEC rebates. We have to take this in totality. There is something that uh, government is supporting. Okay. But at the end of the day, my drive is that individual, you need to have a drive to go to beyond what you are actually capable of. Because that is where you should be asking. I call example my wife, right? Yeah. My wife used to stay in the rental flat with me, but she has a drive at young that when she grows up, she she wants to go out of that community. That's why she upgraded herself. Uh, yeah, too bad after that she got married to me. She didn't. But I think uh, the <laughs> point is uh, the kind of life you want, right. and you have to push. So you must yourself. have that drive and yeah, that hunger. So what you say? If we need to come to a position whereby we don't depend on government for support in terms of our livelihood, that should okay. be the, the drive that every individual of us should aspire to. Yeah, be. and trying stuff like our young entrepreneurs here. Yeah. Uh, but in, in terms of families, we, you know, last year's budget, we did have very specific measures for uh, baby bonus, baby yeah. grants, leave arrangements, including paternity leave. Mm, yeah. This year, we continue to focus on families, but in different ways. Mm. Preschool affordability, uh, housing for young yes. couples. We have a voucher that they can use to rent a flat yeah. before they get their BTO flats. Mm. Healthcare for their seniors, which will be a big help for caregivers, yep. and retirement needs for all of us, because all of us, <laughs> mm. even if we are not at retirement age, we have aging right parents yes. and we worry about right. them. And so to make sure that our seniors have assurance over health uh, for their retirement. Yeah, and that's a very important point because we are an aging society and we all know that. So Pauline, uh, what about that group of people? Uh, how will this budget also be affecting them? We are very excited at ROSA, mm -hmm. uh, which is the Centre for <laughs> Research on Successful Ageing, about the age well, well budget. Mm. Yes. So I think it's very important for us to remember that when we talk about an aging population, it's not a bad thing. Yep. It's only mm. bad if we don't age well. Right? <laughs> and it's also very important to change mindset about post 65ers. They should not be viewed as dormant members like potatoes, you know, that we just you know curate programs, <laughs> feed them and yep. hope that they you know they are happy. I think we need to rethink, you know, what an older person is like in Singapore because especially with the baby boomers crossing over the mm -hmm. post 65, I mean, this group, they are well endowed, they are educated, they are experienced, they have so much more they can give back to the communities right. uh, they are in. So we are you know, excited to see the distillation of age well because I think if, if we can curate, you know, if we can design infrastructure in mm -hmm. our communities that will naturally you know, facilitate social engagement, mm. um, okay. where there are you know, opportunities for older adults to plug in and, and they feel that you know, it's very easy for them to enter the space okay. and just volunteer. Yeah. I think this would be fantastic. So it's almost like, can you see yourself as you get older, instead of just retiring and doing nothing, to be involved in the community, you know, work, perhaps working at a, a stall, helping out serve noodles to, on the I weekends to, you know? exactly what I'll be doing, you know, just uh, <laughs> continually going back. So Making fish balls. I don't know. I think then there's the question of what is retirement to an individual in Singapore, right? Yeah. yeah. Even though um, you want to uh, be, you want to continue to be um, able and continue to feel fulfilled in mm -hmm. life, do you really want to be working until you die? As oh, well? No, you don't want that. You don't yeah. want that. So, so, so aging well, right? It, and we see, see, I think fundamentally the principle is we're not telling people how to retire, but we are saying that if, you know, through all these very positive policies that government has rolled out, if we can maintain good health mm -hmm. and our mobility and maintain your cognition, then you are well. So right. post 65, post 75, it doesn't matter what you choose to do, but you will be able to make that choice. You won't be living mm. with disabilities that hold you mm -hmm. back. Also, you okay. Okay. Yeah. The choice is important. Yeah. I suppose, I mean, if you think about this, our lifespans are getting longer. Yeah. Uh, baby is born today, 
could very well, many of them yeah, live 90s. to their 90s. Yes. Mm, indeed. I mean, and so if you think about retirement <laughs> at 65, what are you going to do for the another for the 30 25, more yes. years? It's a long time. Yeah. And, and so we want people to have good, healthy lives. Yeah. Ideally, the health span is the same as your lifespan. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it would be very sad for many of us if our health deteriorates and in the last 20 and 30 years of our lives are led in ill health, Ill health. bedridden. And I don't think anyone wants yeah. that. Yeah. And the way to have good, healthy lives uh, is to stay connected, is, yeah. to be stay, is to stay engaged. That's why we have healthier SG pushing more on preventive health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why we are also embarking on Age Well SG, to ensure that our seniors are socially connected and engaged. And we have an infrastructure and environment that's friendly for all seniors. So in a way, we, should, we can retire from our jobs, but we shouldn't retire from life. Yes, mm. essentially. Okay. I do have to go to one more question that is uh, uh, on many of our minds, and that's the changes to CPF with the removal of the special account. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, especially for those age 55 and above, um, quite a few people a bit concerned about this, you know, uh, what would, how would you address some of their concerns? Sure. The moves that we have made in this budget, Steve, are very much in line with the purpose and intent of the CPF. The CPF as an ordinary account which is an account where funds can be withdrawn for housing and then you earn short-term interest rates. Yes. But it has a special account which is for long-term purposes, for saving for the long-term and therefore has a higher interest rate. Yep. That's the principle. Yes. Of course, at age 55, you also have a retirement account. So instead of now having special account and retirement account, we are streamlining it into just one, which is the retirement account, which is for the long-term, for your retirement needs. For those who have excess funds in the special account, they can transfer it into the retirement account all the way up to the revised enhanced retirement sum and still earn the same interest rate as the special account. So the vast majority of Singaporeans will be able to do so. And if they do so, they will get more in their retirement account and eventually when they retire, they will get higher CPF payouts for life. Okay. Yeah. I think those are the key words. At the end of the day, you get more in your account and more, more payout when, you know, when you're, you're, you're retired. Hey, g -Man. hi. How's it going, man? Hi, Steve. How are you? Good, good. Oh, so this is your new place? Yeah, this is our third outlet, actually. We took over this entire coffee shop called Tahiti Kopitiam Bar just a month ago. We also own the drink stall and we have a hand at the Indian food stall as well. I see. Is that me? Yeah, she is. She... Actually, she's uh, making some fish balls now. I can make a few. Yeah, I can try. try. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> so what about expanding? Could you guys make like 6,000 fish balls in one day? Definitely, but we need a lot more workers and uh -huh. uh, that would be a challenge because uh, the younger people are not really attracted to this trade. But we've actually resorted to hiring uh, more mature, older workers as uh -huh. well. Like, like how much older are they? So um, we've had one who is close to 90. Wow! Yeah. So we've also had a kitchen assistant. She was okay. uh, past 60. So we managed to reskill her and upgrade her skills from a kitchen assistant to a cook. Wow, so <laughs> nice, right? That looks more like a fish cake. Uh, that's the case, Steve. I think I'll take it from here. It's time to leave. <laughs> I have failed in the fishball arena. My upskilling not so good, eh? <laughs> okay. Yeah, try again. So you guys are diversifying into Indian food as well, on top of managing and running this whole coffee shop. All this in a fairly uncertain economic climate. Aren't you a bit worried about that? Well, we do feel the pressures of inflation, that's for sure. Mm. Like, cost of goods are going up about 10% a year. Okay. Add in your rental, your utilities, you're seeing 20, 30% a year increase. So have you had to increase your prices? Uh, we have only increased one since we started, but we yeah. have no choice but to increase it again. And I was with me and she was saying manpower is one of the other big challenges you guys have. We tried to find a way around it by okay. starting an entirely different business. Oh. What we wanted to do was to supply self-ordering kiosks to right. help all the hawkers in the industry. So that would eliminate the cashier. Essentially, there was a barrier we faced, and that was we needed to be an approved vendor. If we go in as a startup, we will not be able to get the grants for our clients. 
Oh, yeah. I see. So I that see. was the barrier we faced, and we just put it on hold for now and just focus on our food business. I know you guys want to take this brand further, yeah. you plan to expand, but at the same time, young family, I mean, how challenging is that? Well, you've got to juggle your time a lot. Well, you don't have the same stability as right, doing a full-time job, that's okay. for sure. For her, is she in school yet? She's in school, she's actually two. Even though we intended to send her to a public preschool nearby, the waiting list was really long, so we had to settle for another option, private option instead. Okay. Yeah. So I'm sure that also is a, another financial sort of uh, aspect that you have to consider, right? Yeah, of okay. course. Jeevan and May, let's talk about your story first because, you know, you, you've been grappling with uh, rising costs and that's a concern for many SMEs. Uh, tell us more and how you feel some of the, the budget measures will actually help with your situation. Right now, I think it will help us by, with, especially with the corporate tax rebate, mm -hmm. it's going to give us some sort of uh, a little cushion. bit more cushion mm -hmm. during this period, as well as um, increasing our low-wage workers' salary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that because cushion, of the progressive wage credit. Exactly. So that's, that, 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 we appreciate that mm -hmm. one because it's going to cushion us as well. So mm -hmm. we feel this budget kind of, uh, it's basically a bolster support kind of budget for us. That's, that's how we, we view yeah. it for now. But we would also hope to be able to help you in your expansion plans uh, or to go overseas for that matter. Um, there are various schemes that Enterprise Singapore offers mm -hmm. and we would like to see how we can help companies like yourselves scale up and go beyond our shores. Perfect. So you mentioned in the video something about because you are a startup, you mm -hmm. had some issues. I mean, I think we can have a conversation with you and see how we can help you sure. realize some of your plans to you know, expand into new areas. Perfect, that'd be great. So like speaking of new areas, there's um, some schemes like um, the partnership, mm -hmm. the PACT, yes. which uh, helps companies with um, capability transformation right. and all this. And um, as well as uh, uh, research for an innovation and That's for right. enterprise. Yeah. So for small enterprises like ourselves, yeah. how can this um, help us? Some of these schemes may not apply to you because, for example, PACT really applies to companies, Singapore companies or local companies that want to supply to an MNC mm. and they want to form a partnership with an MNC or a larger company that's based here. It may or may not apply to you, but if there are companies that will benefit from such a scheme because we will help them upgrade their capabilities, meet the requirements of, of some of these large multinationals. And then when they meet the requirements and become an approved vendor, they can scale up quite quickly. So if you have that kind of an aspiration, you have a product, a solution that you are planning to sell to a multinational, then yes, you would qualify and then we can help you with, in, in developing that solution further, help you upgrade your capabilities. But if you don't qualify for PACT, there will be other schemes anyway. There are a whole range of Enterprise Singapore schemes, including schemes and support to go overseas, for example, to expand into new markets, to um, upgrade your capabilities, get, uh, you know, automate processes, make use of technology, and we will be able to link you up with Enterprise Singapore to see how you can get full access to the suite of uh, support packages that are available. Okay. Okay. Another concern that I, I know we addressed there was manpower. You know, it's always difficult finding the staff to, to help you grow and expand. And in fact, you had an older worker that was retrained and upskilled, right? Yeah. I mean, but is that a solution for you guys or is that also a very challenging sort of uh, option? Well, I think uh, a manpower, manpower crunch is basically a mismatch of a worker's expectations and, and willingness to work. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, mm -hmm. the manpower is everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. But not many people want to do the jobs that we offer, mm -hmm. especially in the coffee shop space, okay. you know? So that's the main challenge that we face. How do we change the mindset of, I don't know, Singaporeans perhaps uh, to work in a coffee shop? How do we make it more... Fulfilling, yeah. right? Uh, exciting. Higher salaries, because that is the aim as well to help <coughs> low-wage workers earn a better living. But does that prove to be? Because again, that means your cost would rise. Exactly. But uh, well, the the PWCS scheme it, it supports us a little bit uh, for the next two years. After that, we're not sure what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, for now, it, it's going to be a good support cushion for us. Mm. But like I said, there's still a challenge that we need to solve, and that is the fact yeah. that how do we yeah. convince? our local workers to work yeah. in this space. Yeah. Mm. It, right? it, it's not easy uh, and there will be some industries where it's harder to convince young Singaporeans to you know, take up occupations in these or careers in these uh, areas. 
I think pay is only one part of the factor. In the end, it's about you know, pursuing a, a career that's meaningful, that's fulfilling. Um, and everyone has a part to play there. Employers, the HR, everyone has a part to play. Uh, so hopefully through continued efforts, improved salary prospects, better careers, employers leaning forward, consumers also doing their part yes. to recognise workers in these areas and the important contributions that they do. Then societal mindsets over time can change and there will be hopefully uh, young people who would aspire towards you know, professions in these areas, like the two of you too. You are, you are examples that show that it can be possible. I think you have entered this area of F&B. You have set up your own uh, hawker store, you know, running a coffee shop now. So I think there are possibilities and opportunities in this space for young people. On, on this point of rising manpower costs and rising costs of everything, so f for the industry specific, would, would it, um, what does it look like for the industry in terms of prices? Because mm. uh, it's an industry where prices are expected to be low. Yeah. So what is your take on that? So it, it's going to be a challenge. Um, we are in Singapore always going to be quite tight in our manpower, in our labour. Because we are a small country, our businesses are growing, economy is growing, there are many demands, many vacancies that waiting to be filled and, and, and individuals can choose which are the jobs they want to fill. Yep. Um, that's the reality. Uh, the cost structure in Singapore is also what it is today. It's not going to go back to the days of the 70s or the 80s. That's, this is the reality of our cost structure today. <coughs> we have to accept that. And so the way for the industry, for FMB, for example, or for coffee shops, hawkers to continue to thrive is to uh, look at ways to continue to automate, be more productive, and there are grants for, to help uh, FMB operators do so. Kitchen automation, productivity, digital solutions, we will continue to facilitate in those areas. Um, as some of these FMB uh, operations get bigger, for example, then they may even have uh, shared kitchens, for example, mm -hmm. right? To, to, to provide the cooking for more than just one outlet, but multiple outlets. So there are these sorts of solutions that will enable F&B outlets and establishments to become more productive over time. Yeah, I think the, the innovation is important because we all love our hawker food. So it'd be such a pity if one day it goes missing, right? Your favourite fishball stall or cha kway teow. But Saman, I mean, innovation is something that many companies are, are trying to do. And they're trying to also help the, the, their staff, the low-wage workers, and bring them along that journey. But yep. of course, there are concerns that sometimes innovation may then override and take away their jobs. Correct. So I think uh, when we talk about training, the workers' concern is about for the past many years, when I go to training, what is in return for us? Yeah. Right. This is actually the workers' concern. If we can manage that via the different kind of like a CTC grant, right? Which I think government has given to NTUC for mm -hmm. us to work with companies. Company uh, training committees. Uh, what is the good about the CTC grants is actually we input a certain amount of in wages increase that the company must ensure when you go through these grants that is uh, supported by NTUC, there must be a return to the uh, worker itself. Mm -hmm. Today, a worker, after he goes for training, mm -hmm. he will be more highly qualified deliver more better productivity. What we want to ensure the company shares with the worker itself. Okay. If this can be uh, scaled up, everyone will know when I go to training, I become a better worker. In fact, it's actually not just his employability level in yep. the company. It's actually open up for him with the opportunities outside because you're more highly because, skilled. Because he's yeah. more skilled, he should yes, be right, uh, uh, easier to be employed. Yeah, so you know? Rather than you be oh. redundant in the company, make yeah. yourself out and go and seek opportunities. I'm here today to meet a lady who is 50, still working, taking two part-time courses, a single mother and has five children. <sighs> Hi, Catherine. Wow, I feel tired for you just describing that already. How do you manage all this? Hi, Stephen. Um, initially, it's a bit difficult to adapt, but I have to actually train all my kids, five kids, to be very independent. Okay. It's not tough. It's really not tough. Just have the schedule planned out okay. accordingly. This super mum tells me she's finishing a part-time advanced diploma in data protection and starting a postgraduate course in human relations. Uh, the data protection is a three-day course yep. and per module basis. So when I have the scholar session, I will apply leave okay. to study on this. 
Well, the other post grad is a weekend, so weekend no work. I will uh -huh. do the study at my home, okay. which is um, sitting in my living oh, room. Oh, that is your study corner over there. Yes. Can we go take a look? Yeah, sure. Welcome okay. to my study area. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, so I see this is where you do your, your Zoom classes? Yes. How many hours? Catherine has worked in administration for years, which included handling clients' data. She first got interested in data protection about four years ago. I think I should pursue it further and hoping as it will actually give me a better career prospect because right now, data protection is a very in thing. Okay. She started with a basic course at the Singapore Management University using her Skills Future credits and got hooked. So she took up an advanced diploma with her remaining credits. How much has it been able to cover cost-wise? Uh, I would say majority up to at least uh, 50%. Doing this while being fully employed, has that been challenging as well? Um, yes, because the data protection is a consecutive three days mm. course. I need to take leave. Employer might not be that happy because you are constantly, every module taking three days, right. three days. So, yeah. So, how? What would, what would make it easier? Hopefully, the employer can actually support people like us, right? Who is really in into upgrading our skills uh -huh. so we can actually provide more for the company. But Just the company, will, the boss will say, well, why should I send you for a course that isn't relevant to? what you're doing. Yeah, but if you think it the other way around, the positive way is once I attain this qualification, yeah. you can, I can switch role within the company, uh, right? Okay. So it's a form of retaining the staff. Why not? Instead of wasting time, you know, retraining, right. getting a new staff, all this takes time. Is there anything you would like to tell the finance minister? Yes, I hope the finance minister can work with different agency and together with employer to actually help people like me who is keen to keep upskilling ourselves, right? So we can have a better career prospect, give us more skill future credit, and also for people like me, a single parent family, more time for us to do the upskilling as well. You know, we filmed this before yeah, you announced, so, so I, she's I, got I, more <laughs> skills future credit now, right? $4,000 more in skills future credit. I hope Catherine's wish has been yeah, granted I and mean, she will make good use of the credits to continue her reskilling and upskilling journey. I hope so. We will just remind people that basically Singaporeans age 40 and above will get a 4,000 top up in skills future credit. And if they take time off to do a full time course, they'll enjoy training support of up to $3,000 a month for up to 24 months. Yeah, so I mean, Minister, I want to ask you whether such uh, th that top up for skills future credit, was it also to help people like Catherine, you know, in that situation? Very much so. I mean, it's, we recognise that the pace of change in the economy is accelerating. Mm -hmm. Technological advances will mean that some job roles will become obsolete, but new job roles will continue to be uh, created. And yeah. that's why it's very important for workers, especially mid-careers, particularly 40 and above, to have a significant reboot in their skills. And that's what this skills future mm -hmm. enhancement is about. And we hope employers will support their workers for their skills upgrading and workers will take, make full use of these enhancements yeah. in their skills future credits. Mm -hmm. But Saman, I want to come to you because you, you represent a lot of workers. I mean, Catherine seems like the kind, she's quite a go-getter. She's yep. thinking ahead for her yes. future, right? Uh, is that similar with many other workers out there? And will this skills future credit really help those in that situation? So what are your thoughts on this? First and foremost, the skills future credit is the one of most uh, welcoming news to all the workers there, yeah. right? I think like what we hear from her story is about sacrifice, which needs both the worker and the employer. Right? She's right to say some employers may not be mm. easily wants to release you. Mm -hmm. right? But if uh, we have a worker like this, employer also has to change their mindset. If a worker goes for training, that is, yeah. uh, it may not be directly, now for you see, that worker may not be directly benefiting to you. But if a worker comes with certain skills, you may see down the road, it's actually benefiting you. So yeah. at times we are having challenges where employers doesn't want to release. So we need to change the mindset of both worker and employer. Because we see a government has done their part. Right. Giving up the 4,000 case credit and you go beyond that, you've got 3,000 allowance. This is very welcoming, but both parties have to do it. If both parties combine together, I'm very the fundamental that we should, workers should be in the position, but we don't wait to be retrenched. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we make sure we get the skills ready for the next yeah. job opportunity. But now, like <laughs> yeah. Catherine, she wants to do it, she's got the funds to do it, but then her company may say, yeah. sorry, mm. I can't give you time off. Mm. Well, that's why we continue to work very closely across different industries with the unions. We engage companies one by one. We set up company training committees. Yes, 
Uh, we provide funding <laughs> for that too. We get employers on board. We provide additional support for employers. Um, hopefully, more and more will join us in this endeavour. There may be a few that will take a bit longer, but I think in the end also, you know, the market will sort itself out mm. because individuals yep. will know where the better employers yeah. are and they will want to gravitate towards these better employers. Mm. And the ones who don't change will feel the pressure, hopefully, yeah. through market competition to up their HR practices and improve their employment practices and support their staff in training. Yeah, let me ask the sociologist, does that work, that sort of mind games, you think that I will work? I tell you. <laughs> it's market competition, <laughs> it's not mind games. <laughs> okay. Catherine is a very good example of uh, the midlifer Singaporean. So I think moving forward, the skills future credit, thank you, Minister, because it's exactly what mm. we need, right? Because we are living longer and mm. I, you know, it's too idealistic to think that you don't ever have to change a yeah. career, right? Mm. So the idea of somebody having aspirations and wanting to move forward in new areas to challenge yeah. themselves is, is a construct that employers have to accept because that's the only way we can survive, right? Because mm -hmm. for a population demographic where we are going to have older workers mm -hmm. and we're going mm -hmm. to need to keep our workers in the space post-65, because we're not having enough babies, right? <laughs> so if you think about it, if you think about it, if, you're, if you can expand the work life of a, an ordinary worker from 65 to let's say 70 or 75, and you add all that yeah. up, it can, you know, you can put them in, 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 right. in, in, in terms of the number of new workers they can actually replace, right? Yep. Um, young workers. But at the same time, they need to have the right skills. That's right. So the skills future credit is really a big plus. So it's very important then that uh, employers look at workers as not just, you know, items to be fit into the gaps yes. that they have. Right. They have to, it has to be a partnership. Okay. Right? We have to match the aspirations of this, these midlifers. Yeah. It, it's a mindset change for yeah. employers. Yes. Is it a transitional period then that we have um, to face? I think the employers who have embraced this new mindset will find that in the end, yep. It may cost more in the, long, in the yeah. short term because they do have to put in some investments into their workers' training, training. but in the end, they will mm -hmm. emerge better as a company. Yep. And I'm sure this, this has been proven time and again. Mm -hmm. yep. The more progressive employers, the ones who have moved, mm -hmm. can already see the benefits and hopefully more can see this is the way forward mm -hmm. and more yep. companies and employers will join them. But we are hopeful and we are making progress together right. with the unions and as part of our tripartite partnership. Yeah. So I think the CTC grants has actually gone way beyond. Mm -hmm. We've cleared more than 1,000. Uh, it's not just about the grants with the company. What we also make sure that the workers have new skill sets. After doing the, achieving the new skill sets into their new job roles, they have a pay increase. Right. And that is the fundamentals that we want. Right? I think talk about costs. That government funding really helps especially small okay. employers where it doesn't have enough funding, with the government kind of support, that gives us a better lever to push. End of the day to the workers, if I go for training, and it doesn't translate today, I complete my training, tomorrow my pay increase, it's about doing on the job. Right? Mm. And then, then you can see to start, the employer starts to appreciate this worker, his contribution, the productivity savings that they make. What the unions one thing to do is you need to share the savings. Right. You so need to share the problems. Everybody gets uplifted yes, in that sense. Yeah. But maybe I ask you guys, as employers, that would also mean more expensive workers. Yeah, and less productive. I mean, usually if we hire the older workers, they are less productive than the younger ones. Mm. Um, that's a fact. So okay. why would employers mm. be more inclined mm, to mm, mm. But you can't. Really skill <laughs> the older workers <laughs> as opposed to <laughs> hiring younger ones? Mm. No, no, I, I think we have to rethink right, the notion of work and productivity. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Look, you don't have a choice, okay? Bottom line is... <laughs> why don't I? Because the Singapore population is ageing. Right? So unless we're going to continue to rely on surplus labour, younger surplus labour yeah. from, from the region, mm -hmm. we're going to learn how to, we have to learn how to appreciate our own. So, so for example, an older worker may not be as productive as yeah. one younger person. So redesign the job, right? Mm -hmm. Where you allow a work, uh, an yeah. older worker to come and work with you part-time or half the day and you can have two of them and at the end of the day work out a scheme where it's still you know, profitable for you 
and okay. leverage their strengths. So in a way, she's saying our resources are limited. We work with what we have. Sure, innovation can possibly come in to help pick up the slack. I mean, but overall, the picture is still one that can be quite challenging from both sides of the coin. Oh, I'm, I'm, I have no doubt that for certain industries, it can be quite challenging. Um, I mean, it, it's maybe no comfort to those who are in the more difficult sectors, mm. but the overall economy may be doing well. But doesn't mean when the overall economy does well, every industry does yes. well. There will be some industries that are growth industries that are yeah. doing very well. There will be some industries that are suffering. suffering. There will be some industries like hawkers, coffee shops that perform somewhat of a social role, not just an economic role mm -hmm. because they are part of where we grow up, we form shared memories and therefore they are still important to us and we will continue to find ways to support our hawker culture, our coffee shops in different ways, uh, not just in um, productivity and grants, but even in something like CDC vouchers. Yeah. We could have easily <laughs> given CDC vouchers to people in the form of a cash handout. Yeah. Yeah. But we deliberately decided not to and set aside some portion of it for it to be used in heartland shops, yeah. including our hawkers, okay. precisely to benefit our hawkers. So that it kind of it goes back into the economy and helps keep it going. Yeah. Uh, but of course, it's not just the older workers. We're talking about the younger ones as well. Yeah. And the announcement to uh, support more ITE students and graduates, you know, with more funding, uh, I, I think that's very important as well. You know, help them get they get their diploma, they can upskill themselves. Yep. Maybe, yeah, I'll ask uh, Pauline and Samad, uh, will, this, will this help narrow the gap with, with uh, tertiary graduates? Uh, Pauline? I think it, it, I'm sure the <laughs> ITE grads are very appreciative of this, right? So um, it's an important move because it allows them to continue to dream, right? Mm. To reach, rise to their aspirations. So the trick here is, are we ready to receive them? So. I mean, yeah. th these announcements okay. have been fantastic, right? But um, the, de the devil is in the details. So are polytechnics ready to receive a lot of times older ITE graduates? Because I think if we just plug them into existing classes, the chances of success may be, you know, okay. plateaued, right? So for, for Singapore, I think in general, the next step for us in terms of education is learning how to receive older students and mm. leveraging their experience and curating new curriculum, right, that will service right. their needs and not just put them in with our existing classes. I think, I think Pauline, our um, institutes of higher learning are mm. adapting. Mm. So I think I am quite confident that they will be able to take on board these adult learner, learners. Uh, some of them will be fresh grads from the ITE mm. going straight to Polytechnic, but some will be a bit older. And the polytechnics, the ITE themselves will, I'm sure, be able to take them on board and uh, make sure that the curriculum is suitable for their needs. Not to mention that the range of offerings are now much wider. It's not just going to polytechnics alone yep. because the ITEs now also offer their own study technical diploma. diplomas yeah, work and diploma. work-study diplomas yeah. together with a growing pool of yes. companies that are very keen to have these students come on board, work with them, and study at the same time. Yeah. So the range of offerings have grown and we will be able to provide better uh, career and wage prospects for our ITE graduates. So you talk about ITE students. I think these are a group of unique students. Yeah. Right? They are sometimes, uh, hence, uh, skills, skills personnel. Mm -hmm. So by having a head start, giving them the uh, sponsorship, and then even in future, your CPF top up, these are yeah. good things for ITE students. Mm -hmm. the, the challenge is how welcoming, uh, not just about the IHL, but the employers outside taking in IT students. Because nowadays, I think we feel challenged like even in FNB, not many younger generations want to do that. So we need to find what is the challenge for IT students. You can go through a diploma. Right. right? If everyone goes up the ladder from IT, goes to a diploma, goes to a degree, what we are really start to see now is the lack of skilled Singaporeans. Uh, so this one could be, uh, maybe you go as you further your studies, mm. let's deepen the skills that we need. Yeah. We cannot be depending on foreigners to just do skill sets. No, I we completely agree with what Brother Samad yeah. said, that the, the, the idea of encouraging and motivating these mm. students to do a diploma is really deepen. to deepen mm. the skill yeah. sets that they picked up in ITE. Correct. You could be a lift <laughs> technician in yes. ITE, Correct. then you do a diploma in the same area and you deepen your skills, you could do a work-study diploma mm. yeah. and you can work and study at the same time together with one of the lift companies. And there are many opportunities like that in different areas which we are trying to build up more of.
Okay, well, thank you all very much for sharing your thoughts tonight. We have uh, come to the end of this, and I, I guess in closing, perhaps, Minister, you, you want to give us a bit of a wrap-up? Sure. What would you like to say? Well, th thanks, everyone, for sharing your inputs, your feedback and suggestions. Uh, it's been very good talking to all of you. Uh, we didn't spend much time talking about the external environment, but in fact, this year's budget takes place amidst dramatic changes in the world around us. Um, you know, we've enjoyed peace and stability for about 30 years in this post-Cold War era. But all that is changing because we are entering a new environment, a new era that will be marked by conflict and confrontation. And unfortunately, it will be a world that will be more violent, more fragmented, and messier and just more unpredictable. We can't do very much about that. We have to accept the world as it is. But we can also confidence or draw confidence, take heart from what we have been through since independence because we have had to navigate similar external disruptions and shocks before, be it the British withdrawal in the 60s, the oil crisis in the 70s, financial crisis in 97, or even recently the COVID pandemic. And each time we went through such a difficult environment or situation, we weathered the storm and we emerged stronger than before. So I am confident that we can do so again, so long as we stay united, work together and continue to keep faith with one another. And that's what this budget is about. This is just one step in our road ahead. It's, I hope, a good first step. Mm -hmm. There will be more to come. But I hope this first step will give us confidence that all of us can continue to build a better future for ourselves and our children, even in an increasingly troubled world. And this is a journey that will go on for a long, long time. <laughs> thank you so much for, to everyone. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister, thank Samad, you. Pauline, Jeevan, Amey. Thank you all for coming thank and sharing you. your thoughts. If you'd like to watch the budget speech or read up more about the measures and what they might mean for you, you can check out cna.asia slash Budget 2024. On that note, I'm Stephen Chia saying bye for now. Thank you, everyone.